and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple of newcomers into the temple. They are the double-headed monster that is Granite Glyph Publishing, currently developing Hedgar Helgard, Curse of Kaina, which is a infernal design for one-shots. In the red in the red corner, we have Max Carr, spelled with two R's, and in the Blue, in the blue corner, we have Mikhail D. Sabag. How are you two doing today? We're doing, doing well. Good. No complaints. <laughs> you know, we're, I, we're... Like, I like being introduced as, what was it, the double-headed monster? <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Oh, I need some walkout music or something. That's fun. Yeah. Do, do, do. Uh. <laughs> Some world wrestling stuff. I was gonna say I can only do the, the no, no, first no. three notes. Otherwise, I don't, I'll get slapped with that. I don't do I don't do that Junior Land shit around here. I stick I stick <laughs> I stick to the glory the glory that is strong style in King's Road. Oh, okay. which is a night which is a nice way of say which is a nice way of saying I I stick to the Indies, Japan, Japan, and Mexico. Hell yeah. Um, I have uh, I have a friend who's big into Japanese pro wrestling, and I've seen some stuff, and man. Those leagues, they go hard. Oh, they incredible. Oh, they do. I um, I got my I got my start with that. Looking at a lot of the a lot of the stuff in the Four Pillars of Heaven era of all Japan, and then later on right. with Noah. Okay. Um, cool. And just a bunch, just a bunch of stuff in New in New Japan and um, and tri and AAA over in Mexico. Yeah, oh, that's so cool. Um, the audio was and and some of the. Everybody, some people, some people get squeamish about death matches here in the states. You have no idea how sheltered we are if you've if you've never seen a Japanese death match. <laughs> like, what do we what do we have here? Bar, what do we have here? Barb barbed wire, nails. <laughs> Definitely another world. <laughs> yeah, let's yeah let's let's break out the fucking piranhas. Oh my. <laughs> I was gonna say, Max and I were like, we've designed this horror game, and yet we might be some of the most squeamish people you've ever had on. We'll find out. Um, yeah, yeah. You wouldn't be the first. Good to know. So, I'd like to start at the humble beginnings. How did you guys first get into ta into tabletop? What was your origin story? Oh, Max's starts long before mine does. Oh my goodness. Okay. Uh, well. All right. In an, in another life, you know, uh, I uh, I was in the martial arts world, and many years ago, many decades ago, at this point, um, I had a I had a friend in that world who would bring in his second edition um, D and D books, his monstrous manual, and the player's handbook, and the game master guide, and all that stuff. And so that's how I first learned to play. And I remember it was exciting because it felt like sort of forbidden lore, right? You know, I was going through this monster manual as though these creatures were out there going oh my goodness you know what like, what do you mean like if i play this game i might encounter this I, what's a beholder how what do i do if i you know if i if i run into one in in the uh, in the adventure and so for me it was it was magic from the start and from there you know years and years of probably playing every tabletop game you could imagine just to love at first sight mm-hmm I didn't get started until much, much later. I think my first D&D &D game was when I was 19, and we did a one-year campaign uh, with some friends, and none of us had really ever played before. So I remember I was playing a wizard, and we had our first, it was our first session, and we had our first round of combat, and I was like, all right, cool, we're starting combat. I'm going to begin preparing my spells because apparently I need to prepare spells as a wizard. Like, and I had no context and, and we were all like, and we're like, Oh yeah, that all sounds great. Uh, but it turns out that the people I'd been playing with who were totally new to D and D had played a lot of world of darkness games. So a year later I started playing vampire with them and I kept playing D and D with other groups and, you know, just kept, you know, adding more and more TTRPGs to my repertoire. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Now, that now with that in mind, were you guys mostly D and D lifers, or did, or did you no. did you experiment did you experiment with other systems? Well, you know, it's funny you mentioned uh, 
we're not. I love D and D. Has a special place in my heart, right? It, it's the it's the giant, and it does what it does just phenomenally well. Um, but I think if you were to look at my bookshelf, it, it reads more like a, a library, right, than than a small collection. We play. I mean, even at the moment, I can say just off the top of my head, we are running at least three games right now. Some of them are in fifth edition D and D. Uh, we have a Legend of the Five Rings game. We play Seven C. Uh, we have a weekly alien rpg one-shot game that uh, we're playing vampire the masquerade i mean really everything uh, everything you can imagine no by no means um sort of married to any system but each each does something differently and and different well so we really enjoy sort of opening the hood and, and seeing how they work mm -hmm. now with that with that in mind how did how did how, how did Hellguard really really come to be? Oh, oh wait, God. Miguel, you <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would uh, flash back to probably like two years and some change, and uh, I, it got to a point where um, we had been where Max and I had been having all these conversations about hacking systems. And, and about implementing house rules and doing everything that we can to make our games as good as possible, kind of with an emphasis on being like, oh, okay, well, what's the best way to run a horror game? Like, can you do sustained horror over multiple, like, throughout a campaign? Is it better as one shot? Blah, 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 blah. And we kept having these conversations so much so that our friends were like, you guys need to shut up already and just go make a game and we're like Haha, yeah where are we ever going to find the time to do that but we looked at each other from across the day more like hey maybe this is something we'll do and then uh the COVID-19 pandemic happened and suddenly we found ourselves chained to our computers a whole lot more than we had been previously and um I, I'm working on my degree, and and Max recently had a child, and so we were we had many many sleepless nights where we had a more time that we couldn't spend sleeping, and we had to be doing something. So we ended up looking more and more into this idea of designing a game, and what began sort of as some early just initial conversations and some spitballing, we put that onto a Google a Google Doc, and then we loaded that onto a drive and started collecting pieces of, piece of inspiration on Pinterest. And more and more as the game momentum, the idea became more and more real. And we began showing it to other people. and like, hey, does this have legs? And we got some great feedback. Some people thought it was terrible. Some people were like, this is a great idea, but it's terribly implemented. And so it was just a, a long iterative cycle uh, made possible, brought to you by a global pandemic. Yeah, and then we, we had the really fortunate, you know, um, I, I suppose it is, it's just good fortune. Uh, as we met people and we had certain relationships out there in the space, you know, people would hear about it, talk with us, uh, play it, and then get excited. And then they would hop on board. And all of a sudden we look and, and we have, you know, the amazing Ed Greenwood, right? Who is it's helping us uh, contributing with fiction. Uh, we had uh, Monster Fight Club, um, LLC, right, who hopped on board and, and designed these incredible miniatures. We had artists, we had editors and writers, and, you know, it just grew, and, and I think it was um, the merit of the game itself and the idea that, that we sort of have to thank for that, uh, that amazing team. So that certainly propelled us forward to where we are here. And tons of playtesting. So, so much playtesting. Oh my yes. god. <laughs> well, to be, to be fair, the to be fair, um, you need you need that playtest in order to refine things because, well, not to put too fine a point in it, but oftentimes the first thing you do sucks. Yeah. Oh, certainly. Well, and I'll tell you what, you know, it, it also uh, uh, things way down the line uh, can suck. You know, we were we it was important to us that we had uh, strong relationships with playtesters in a lot of cases. You know, we we take everybody out and and sit them down and just watch. You know, we run the same encounter a dozen times in, in an hour and say, okay try to break this like what parts are fun what's not you know what delivers on the promise on the fantasy what's holding you back uh, where's a moment that was a triumph Where, where's a, where's a moment you wished you could have done something and what was that something mm -hmm. and so we uh, we endeavored to deliver those yeah yeah now Helgard de defines itself as horror fantasy very very clearly and yes. You guys have name dropped Diablo, Castlevania, Call of Cthulhu, and and so on. What made you guys go with a a full on dark fantasy or even horror fantasy? 
Well, that's a, that's a, I mean, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll throw my hat in and then Mikhail maybe have a different answer. But for, for me, um, you know, when I think of one night RPGs, you know, I, I think horror is something that's very difficult to capture in an authentic sort of uh, immersive way at the table. Don't get me wrong, you can have a horrible game, that's horrifying, I guess, right? But but really, you know, genre horror. Uh, and I think certain systems do it triumphantly, do it really well. Call of Cthulhu is one of them. Um, the Alien RPG, you know, from um, a Free League and then by Modiphius, right? They, they're phenomenal. And so the one night RPG space is uniquely suited to horror, right? Not just that, but we, we look out there and we love one shots, we love convention play, we've run. You know, we run games for conventions and, and traveled all over the place. Um, a lot of systems promise to deliver great one shots, right? But but they're never quite able to deliver or commit on that. You know, it's tough. Either they have to give you a bunch of pre-generated characters or you hand wave half the rules because you don't have time to implement them or teach them or whatever it is, right? It's it's an unreasonable ask to, to look at someone and say, hey, I, I want you to spend three hours building a character for a three-hour one-shot? That, that's kind of a goofy question. So we thought there was um, an opportunity out here to develop a game that was really built for one-shots, that was pick up and play out of the box. We, we, we didn't want a player to have to open the rule book while they were playing. So we even explained how the powers work on the character sheets, right? Um, you know, it, it does what it says on the tin. So, mm -hmm. You know, it was a, the confluence uh, of an opportunity to develop a one-shot game, you know, one-shots being uniquely suited to horror, and then, at least personally, horror RPGs are some of my favorites. I mean, I can kind of look back at many, many years and many Halloween nights, turning the light off, you know, cranking the air conditioning, making it chilly, and getting flashlights out and playing a Call of Cthulhu game. That That's iconic for me. Well, you're in California. It should be, the weather being chilly would be horrifying. No kidding, no kidding. It's just if it starts to rain, it's uh, it's chaos, right? <laughs> yeah, and mean meanwhile, me up and all the way in Minnesota is laughing. How about you, Mikael? What what do you think? I was gonna say I don't have a ton more to add to that. I think one of the as Max and I decide to go in on this venture, we're like, well, we're you know, and fortunately, the team has sort of grown and blossomed beautifully as we've able as we've found other people who love these ideas and the core premise and the world and all that, and they've been able to bring their talents to it and, and really make it come alive. But yeah, from day one, when it was just Max and I, we're like, well, we're only two guys. We need to scope this as much as we can. We can go out and make a giant five E setting, and that would be fun. But man, what a massive undertaking that can be to like really do it and to really do it well or to do an entire long flesh out campaign and so this idea of like hey well we've run a ton of one shots we love one shots and horror is some is one of the the only times you can do horror really really well at times it seems is with one shots so why not do a horror game and then i think the other major component of it was looking at the horror games that exist like uh out there when we look at examples like Castlevania and Diablo specifically, those are wonderful examples of what I like to call like sort of technicolor dark fantasy. And it's made possible by the fact that they're video games, so they can be bright and spectacular. Or even the uh, anime adaptation of it on Netflix, uh, for Castlevania at least, like it can be so bright and beautiful and spectacular. And we don't see a ton of that in RPGs. So thematically, I, I was, I certainly, uh, was hoping that we could bring something that we hadn't quite seen where we have a ton of grim dark fantasy games out there for tabletop and we have like a lot of super heavy metal uh, uh, horror games out there but we don't have that technicolor dark fantasy all that much mm -hmm. now with truth be told some truth be told Something else that was that I ended up thinking of when I was going through the uh, when I was going through the art and a lot of the aesthetic um, present with Helgard is oddly enough the er, the er, some of the early works of Id. Hmm. Um, specifically the specifically the stuff that's been done over the years with Doom and the and the original Quake. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And one of one of our early logo designs that I did long before we hired a professional and very accomplished logo designer. But I remember I showed it to somebody, and they're like, "Mikhail, this looks like Doom and a mobile game. How to be?" <laughs> so I'm not surprised that aesthetically it's kind of 
uh, still in that in that space. And to a le- to a certain extent, I'd also bring I'd also bring up the best of the build Holy Trinity, um, blood. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Which is apropos because we're in a bit of a old school FPS renaissance over the last few years. Oh yeah, I was gonna say uh, I, uh, Hexen was one of my favorite games growing up, and I am I'm pretty terrible at FPSs, but Hexen was something that appealed to me so much thematically that, and and I was probably far too young to be playing it, um, but I remember just being captivated by by the entire aesthetic of it. Um, it's at this point that I feel like I'm about to attack your childhood, but um, I have a love hate relationship with Hexen. <laughs> You know what? I I don't think I ever finish it because I again I was that terrible. I think I probably died to fall damage and and I just I probably save scummed and uh, still didn't beat it. <laughs> I have beaten it. Granted, granted, I've beaten the PC version. I've never touched the um, N64 version. But Hexen is a is a picture perfect example of what I like to call handbreaking or what my brother calls guide damn it. All right, all right, unpack that for me. Um handbreaking is a term is a term that my buddy Paul Duran came up with and I and I adopted that's meant to be the polar opposite of handholding. It is where the is where an obstacle is placed in front of the player, but the solution is far too obtuse to be able to come up with naturally without some, without some sort of foreknowledge. Um, this is the reason why King's Quest is my whipping boy, because every King's Quest game has had that problem. A lot of, in fact, a lot of point-and-click adventure games have this problem where the solution to a puzzle is a little bit obtuse. Or, this, or, it's, in, or it's a chain of events that you couldn't rationally go in blind. You couldn't assume someone could be able to figure it out just going in blind. Um, right. I if I had to use a more popular example from my childhood, it would be Death Mountain in Zelda Two. That's the one I go. That's my go-to example for this kind of thing. But in Hexen, the big example is the Seven Portals, where the Im- the amount of steps in order to get through that hub area is ridiculous. And apparently, switch hunting counts as a puzzle, <laughs> which. <laughs> Is not is not the case. Plus, you have Etten showing up every every few minutes, which made the whole thing a draining experience. On a technical level, I like Hexen, but on but on a gameplay level, fuck it. <laughs> you know what? It's it's a horror unto itself. A different kind of horror, we'll say. <laughs> I look at it. I look at it as um as the, as rape. Raven Software are ve- are very good de- are very good game designers, and I think with that one they were getting a little bit ambitious. Yeah, I can um, see that. Yeah, they 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 dialed things back with Hexen Two, although they probably had to because going to 3D meant that there were things you couldn't do anymore. But mm-hmm. the but the key thing is that is that this mix is that this mix of horror and fantasy is a is a well worn motif though. For whatever reason, you don't see it in fil- you don't see it in film all that much. I think the last outright horror fantasy I I watched was Season of the Witch, and that was because it had Ron Perlman and Nick and Nick Cage That's as knights right. in, in a medieval buddy cop movie. <laughs> it was it was <laughs> dumb as hell, but uh, but I have a so- but I have a soft spot for that kind of thing. And there was Conquest by Lucio Fulci, aka the Godfather of Gore, but Conquest is weird. <laughs> like really weird. Agreed. I, I I and I'm also I'm thinking of Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters with uh Gemma Arderton and and uh Jeremy Ritter or mm-hmm. uh gosh Jeremy Renner that's mm-hmm. who it was. Um, which it feels like the diet version of Season of the Witch, I suppose. Yeah, the Seven Eleven version of it. And there was there was that film adaptation of Solomon Kane, which wasn't great, but um, but James also Pier- not terrible. That, was, that wasn't bad. Yeah, it was. Ca- was I cool. think I think James Purifoy had back problems after that from carrying the film. <laughs> he did a great job. He did a phenomenal job. He's good it, in everything, though. It was it. 
I I liken it to I liken it to Jolie's performance in Maleficent, where the there is a higher energy when the, when when they're on screen and when and when they're not. Um, everything everything is just of lower quality. Yeah. Maleficent yeah. is definitely another one of those movies that. Yeah, I agree. He's is carried on the back of it. It is both a vehicle for that person's career, and also they're the perhaps one of the only people doing a ton of work to make the thing itself work. Yeah. yeah. Now, with that with that in mind, I've I've seen I've seen my fair share of games designed for designed for one shots. Some of them use pre gens, and some of them don't. Yes. What yeah. gave What gave you guys the what gave you guys the reasoning to do um to do pre-gen. to do pregens yeah. in the yeah. style that you did? I can kick it off and a, a couple things, right? <clears throat> um, first and, and foremost was I, I, you know, and we I guess to back up, we, we had this conversation and, and debated it, and we flip flopped our positions like like we tend to do many times, um, and eventually one thing. You know, of course, the positive part of building your own character is you identify with the character, right? You customize it. Um, you know, one of the negative parts is it's time consuming, right? It, it's a really difficult ask, and and we asked ourselves, okay, well, if we're if we're taking you know an hour, um, even just an hour or thirty minutes, right, out of a two and a half, three and a half hour experience, that's a lot that we're asking, you know, and we're not necessarily doing what we promised on the tin, which was this is a pick up and play game out of the box. Uh, the second thing was. Of course, if we could develop each of the characters and their abilities, um, number one, you know, we could um, we could ensure a level of balance. You know, certain systems, even like a D and D, you know, you you run into the problem of system mastery, right? As a as an entry point, an access gate. All of a sudden, if two people, you know, who are sitting down to build characters in thirty minutes, one of them's played the game for ten years, one of them hasn't. You're very likely to have one character who is far and away, you know, fifty percent more. Uh, effective in the game than the new player. We didn't want that, right? Uh, but uh, the the other part is we could closely key the adventures to our characters' abilities, right? There's nothing less uh, satisfying. There's nothing more irritating in some ways than building your whole character around, well, you know, whatever. I'm I'm going to speak with dead, right? Um, or uh, or something like that. You know, I'm, I'm going to be a, a necromancer who can speak with the dead. And then you get into the adventure, and it's one shot, and there are no there are no corpses or skeletons to speak to, right? Or, or more to the point, the dead have nothing interesting to say. That's a bummer. We didn't want that. So it's handcrafted, hand curated. All of the abilities matter. There are opportunities to use them. We tried to balance them uh, in terms of their flavor, right? So that each of them is designed to appeal to a particular archetype. You know, John Wick used to talk about the My Guys effect where, you know, if you remember the old Legend of the Five Rings, right? Hmm. You Just like Vampire the Masquerade today, and, and maybe back then. You I, al- I also movie. remember how John Wick made some busted-ass void magic back in the day. <laughs> well, hey, you know, he, Monty, Cook, they were all responsible for a lot of broken but awesome things. And, and hey, I'm, I'm the first to say I had a blast. But, yeah. uh, you know, you, you'd see your clan or, you know, uh, of samurai or your vampire clan or your class, and you, uh, you would instantly recognize, oh, that's my guy, right? Like, that's the one. You, you've ever been to a convention where you sit down at the table, you know, the GM, you have an hour to play. The GM has the pregens out spread across the table and immediately three hands slap, boom, 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 right onto their character. They see the picture, they see the name, they know that's who I want to play. Mm-hmm. We thought, well, if we can build pregens that effectively do that, right? It's that obvious and, and enticing. Then, boom, you know, we've we've made it. Has um, anyone, when looking at the pregens that you guys have done, made the comparison between what you guys are doing and the playbook system in a Powered by the Apocalypse game? Okay. <laughs> so interestingly, Go ahead. one of the uh, when we were toying around with the idea of character creation, uh, we looked at Powered by the Apocalypse games, and we're like, "All right, cool. Well, you know, Apocalypse World itself, Dungeon World, Monster Hearts Two, uh, Urban Shadows, all of these games have the ability for you to customize your character in relatively short order by picking menu style off of a character sheet and checking in, checking off the things that you want and the things that you don't want." And we had played around with that for, I want to say, three to four months before we eventually realized that, at least with our playtester group, we're like, you know what, this is 
becoming really unwieldy. Uh, it, it just wasn't working for the kind of experience we were trying to create. So as we tried, we tried playing around with that same sort of a set of tools, and it didn't work for what we were going after. Um, yeah. So if I, I don't know if there have been many comparisons to playbooks since we moved away from that, but there's definitely some of that DNA still in there for sure, even though we've removed quite a bit of the choice. Yeah, but and also come brings to mind. I mean, I, we talked about you know balancing these characters against each other for adventure. Part of that is not just investigation and your narrative powers, but your combat powers. We we wanted each of these to have very tight loops, right? Like it's look at Torvald the Breaker, right? This tremendous molten skin barbarian. You know, you look at his abilities in combat, right? What, he throws out an uh, uh, an iron molten hook and drags people into reach. He swings his titanic sword around in a big 360 degrees. And he does more damage the more people are around him. He goes into a rage. All those things work together really tightly. You look at it and it's obvious how it's, how it's meant to be played at a high level, right? In the same way, um, Amelia the Sage, right? The, the sort of arcane, you know, war, a war mage character. She can swap places... Um, with the enemy and then drop fireballs so you go oh my gosh and you, you know you swap three times on a turn rapidly and you can group a bunch of bad guys up together having swapped them around and drop a fireball into the middle so all those loops work together out of the box as yeah. opposed to something like a, well just to take a legacy system like a 3.0 or 3.5 D, D or pathfinder in order to make your cool combo work you, you had to kind of plan it out and, and at a certain level, unless you were experienced in the system, it became obvious if you hadn't planned it well, right? Um, by level five, you're going, well, you know, maybe I should have built out this feet tree this way, or I'm going to be punished for trying my one cool thing. Uh, and, and it was a system and, a, and a, an effort in itself, right, to build a character that sort of worked the way you had uh, planned in your mind. So love all of the systems, but for a pick up and play game, you know, we wanted to we wanted you to feel like twentieth level fighters and wizards right off the bat, without having to know how it worked. Oh, uh, speaking of that, I'd like to I'd like to go into the pre gens and kind of get a feel for the game for the gameplay sandbox that that each of them offers. Yeah, and I'll start from I'll start from top to bottom, and the first one, of course, is Gwyn the Knight. Yes. Uh, okay, phenomenal. Mikhail, do you want to take it away? We'll take turns. And yeah, sure. Just to, before, oh. just as a follow up, I think it, I think it might be, it might, it might be a good idea to recom to um, recommend what, pl what um, players of uh, of. Oh of yeah, good cla idea. Certain classes like, would be in character. Oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Great idea. So the knight, um, the knight is definitely for people who I have uh, a number of people who a number of friends who, when we all sit down to play, they're like, "So what's the paladin class look like in in whatever game we're playing that night?" And I'm like, "Well, I'm so glad you asked because ours is the knight." Uh, Gwyn, who's our pregen, who represents all of the knights, uh, she's like a paladin cleric type character. She uh, is dressed in complete like head to toe. Well neck to toe, uh, full plate armor. And, and all of the characters sort of have these, because the game itself is divided roughly into two phases, one which is sort of the most of the game, which is uh, investigation. And then towards the end of the game, you have sort of grid-based combat as well. And they have different suites of abilities for each. When she is, she comes from this long bloodline of uh, protectors of the realm, basically the master strategists of the world, the ones who uh, essentially helped win the campaign against hell many centuries ago. And so she herself is a brilliant tactician. She's able to command NPCs with divine authority and enforce laws. She's able to hear the unspoken uh, desires of someone's heart. And so she gains access to information that way. She is able to relieve suffering with a touch and, and ingratiate herself and get on people's good side uh, through the use of some small minor abilities that she has there. And then when it comes to combat, like she has the, immediate, the ability to immediately uh, dash to somebody's side whenever they get attacked. And she's able to block that incoming blow and take somewhat reduced damage. 
The kicker is that there's very, very little magical healing in the game whatsoever. So all of these moves where she's able to interpose herself between uh, her allies and her enemies puts her at greater risk. But then she's able to blow, uh, charge them back in totally anime style. If she charges them into a wall, the wall splinters, they take extra damage. It's it's pretty great. She's uh, been a real fan favorite, quote unquote, if we can even say fan favorite at this stage. But the playtesters have really liked her. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting... Well, you already answered the question. This was that. This is definitely for the more paladin type of people. Oh, Absolutely, especially yeah. since you have one hundred percent less chance of that guy fucking it up with fall or die situations. You know who you are. <laughs> we we have no fallen paladins in, in Kana. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's great. Yeah, I, I just I just have to give people like that a bunch of shit because I've I've had way too many horror stories of GMs doing that doing that kind of thing. And some of their names are in my personal book of grudges. <laughs> but at the same time, I will say this. I, I myself am not a paladin player, but I can absolutely understand the temptation of wanting to flirt with that line as part of your as part of your narrative if you're if you are playing a paladin. You're like, well, maybe I have a crisis of faith. Maybe it would be interesting if I, you know, begin to doubt whether or not I'm doing the right thing, or maybe I see that the that being lawful good doesn't get everything done. I, I understand the temptation. Mm -hmm. um, so next is the Breaker. Oh, yeah. I guess I'll take it. So, okay, so Torvald, the Breaker. The Breakers are awesome, so to, I, I won't lore dump too much, but, uh, you know, 660-some-odd years ago, right, there was this great cataclysm, this, this war with demon, with hell, uh, and humanity, you know, had these uh, exceptional warriors uh, who sort of stood up and, and led the charge against him. Um, the Breakers are from that uh, that bloodline, the, the frontline fighters, right, who fought those many years ago. And each each of these classes is sort of saddled with a curse, right, some remnants of that conflict with Hell years ago. The Breaker, you can see, if you look at the art here, mm -hmm. uh, the, the effects of that curse are very visual, okay? So the Breakers who fought as frontline fighters that they are cursed to pass down the scars of those conflicts with hell to their their children. Right, so all of a sudden, you know, a breaker from some long lineage like Torvald um, has all these molten magma uh, sort of cord uh, angry scars over him. Mm -hmm. This is definitely a class for folks who enjoy the fighter and the barbarian, the folks who do a ton of damage. They like big weapons and big hits and cleave attacks and whirlwind, and they like to rush into the fight. We wanted to reward all of that. Okay, so you know, important that each of these classes had a role not just in combat but in investigation. You know, sometimes in in some of these tabletop games, you get a, a, a character who's built for combat, and you know they're they're doing great as long as you're fighting. But then when it comes to social encounters, right, they tend to take a back seat. We wanted everyone to have a role to play in in everything. So the breakers, for instance, right. In terms of investigation, a breaker can take his cursed blood and drip it onto the ground, and it shapes and shifts and forms into a map, okay, of the surrounding area. It shows him secret doors, and more importantly, it shows him other people who are lying in wait, right, or even bodies around. Um, likewise, he can set fire to, uh, to something by dripping his blood onto it. He can hear the heartbeats of creatures nearby. Uh, he can radiate heat outwards. And then when it comes to combat, right, I mean, the guy kicks off. He runs into the fray. He gets bonuses to damage for every enemy near him because if he's in the thick of it, in the dangerous fray, in hell, so to speak, right? Um, that, that's where he lives, that's what he enjoys, that's, that's all he knows, right? So, um, you know, you can use your iron uh, molten hook, hook people in close to you, whip your tremendous sword, you can see in the miniature and the artwork, this huge molten sword. That sword is powered and heated with his own blood. It's not a magic sword, Torvald's the magic sword, right? Um, anyway, that he's one of my favorites, another fan favorite is, is mm -hmm. Torvald the Breaker. Yeah. Um, next is Kezia the Shadow. I'm going to let Max take this one again because I know the spellcasters are at the end and they're my favorite. Ah, there we go. <laughs> all right, we'll trade off. So, Kezia the Shadow, another favorite. Pro of all the set, maybe my favorite miniature, right? If you look at the action point pose, she's down and clearly in action. She's swooping on her knee as she kind of slides along the floor. Uh, the shadows in that conflict with Hell years ago on, on Kena. 
Um, the shadows had a, a, a specific and peculiar maybe role. They were the frontline scouts, right? So not like the, the breakers, right? The sort of shock troops. The shadows were uh, rangers, you know? Um, you, you sort of think of long-range reconnaissance patrol, right? Mm -hmm. Like they would go into enemy lines and they had to not just survive behind the enemy lines of hell, they had to be able to hide. And it's one thing for a mortal or a, or a human rogue, right, to jump over and hide behind a barrel, but to hide from a demon in Cana, right, who can detect your blood, who can hear your breath, who can who can literally taste your fear on the air. The shadows had to be able to do more than that, right? So they not only became suffused with shadow, they had to find darker, deeper, more nasty places to hide. The shadows then mastered the dark, okay, over that, to, over that period in Cana's history. Kezia is the descendant, right, of one of those lineages. You can see there are wisps of shadow rolling off of her. This is a class for, and maybe I should have started with this, this is a class for uh, the folks who play rogues or assassins, right? Skill monkey uh, classes, that kind of thing. They're going to have fun. Uh, in terms of investigation, you see, if you look at her eyes, they're amber and they're glowing, right? That's uh, deliberately so. Kezia of the Shadow, if she looks at you, a mortal uh, in Cana, she can detect their deepest fear, which is useful in investigation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, she can snuff out sources of light with a thought. She can wrap herself right in shadow. She can send telepathic messages to other party members because she's a scout. I mean, we've all had that problem where your rogue or your ranger is 100 feet up ahead, they found the bad guys, and then they go, well, I tell my friends. And it's like, well, how do you do that? You're 100 feet away. Well, she mm -hmm. can telepathically do that. When it comes to combat, she's a dervish, right? She's incredible. She has the ability, anytime you see a shadow on the map, she can step into that shadow and exit any other shadow on the map, right? Every time she makes a kill against the demon, she takes on their life force, it fuels her frenzy, and she gets another action immediately, right? So where Torvald might jump in and weaken everybody with this titanic uh, move and, and wipe them, she will run around picking off enemies, oftentimes multiple in a turn, right? As you know, she, she drops one, steps into a shadow, gives her another action, she zips off and, and drops the next one. That, uh, that one of my favorite characters, absolutely for sure. And some of the coolest in the game, I think, is Kezia. Mm -hmm. Who's next? Um, next is the witch. Brom the oh, Witch. Brom the Witch. So, Brom the Witch is thematically, for anyone who likes Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, or Salem, or Penny Dreadful, and likes their witchcraft super dark and spooky, and mechanically, uh, for anyone who likes to play the face character, like in Shadowrun, or who likes bards or charisma-based spellcasters, the Warlock is a pretty uh, close analog for D&D. And the witches in Cana have a very cool history where of these uh, five ancient families who pledged fealty to uh, mankind and to help them fight off hell, uh, back in the day, the witches were more like druids. But uh, something happened along the way where they realized through their magical foresight that they were not going to win this conflict. So they actually went rogue and made a contract with 13 demon kings. And they said, hey, you know, if you pull your resources from this fight and bind yourself to our service, we will give you whatever you want in return. And they said, all right, cool. Give us your king. And the witches said, that's a pretty steep price. You know, the king of all people. Um but very well. So they hand. So the next night, the king is dead or disappears, and the uh, witches now have suddenly thirteen demon lords, you know, who command legions unto themselves, uh, bound to their service. However, nature recoils on them for the blasphemy of this act, and now all of their magic is tainted and somewhat necrotic and profaned, as it were. Mm -hmm. So these days, the witches, who have greatly portrayed all of the rest of mankind, now have to hide themselves away. So they're master shape changers and illusionists. They have hidden themselves in the upper echelons of noble houses, essentially hiding in plain sight. Um, but which... And they also have these incredible abilities that they use. The eh, excuse me, that they can use in investigation. They can appear as another creature from a distance, which allows them to uh, deceive others. They can spoil or uh, taint food and water just by looking at it. And they can also uh, use their uh, the ancient vestiges of their druidic powers to command small animals to carry out simple tasks for them. Mm -hmm. You know, things like snakes and spiders and all the spooky crawling things of the earth. Mm -hmm. They're also able as mentioned earlier to perhaps kiss a corpse and ask questions of the dead 
In combat, though, this is, uh, for people who've played a lot of uh, point-and-click action RPGs, this is much more your park-and-bar character, uh, whereas everyone else is going to be super dynamic, moving around the field a ton. The witch is more likely to be moving slowly with a, a very infernal presence. They're actually able to empower their own spells with the same demonic energies that Hell uses, so as your enemies get stronger, so does the witch. Mm -hmm. uh, Brahm is able to uh, control the minds of lesser creatures so he can take the minions have them attack each other and then line them up in a row before blasting all of them with a bolt of essentially plague infested wind mm -hmm. and my favorite part is the piece de resistance if you will I like how I butcher the French on that but uh, death is not the end for Brahm if he dies, there is a chance he releases his spirit out, and there is a chance that if he is able to kill a minion with it, he then gets to possess its body and keep fighting. Mm -hmm. Which is super cool. He's yep. he's one of my favorites. And lastly, the sage. Oh gosh, there's this is the problem with this interview structure is that there's only two of us, and there's five characters, and we love them all equally. <laughs> well, not equally. You could take uh, this one. Okay. Go for it. You take this one. Or, or, or we can go back and forth, and it'll be utter chaos. Uh, the sage is for anyone who likes to play wizards and learned, uh, like, intelligence-based spellcasters who like big, splashy evocation effects and time magic. Like, there's definitely, like, a little bit of Doctor Strange in there. It, there's a lot of cool stuff with her. Um, the sages are from an ancient bloodline of lore keepers and wizards and time and star magicians. Um, they actually are afflicted with a supernatural aging curse, so they die prematurely. And Amelia, this one care, and, and most of them actually live in these massive underground libraries. Um, it's funny, and re I'm, I'm realizing how similar they are to rabbits now. But they live in these massive underground libraries, and many of them never see the light of day. Amelia, our sage, uh, decided uh, she wanted more for herself, and so she decided to join this covenant of monster hunters. And alongside them, she is able to use her powers of time and memory to pick up objects and uh, see flashes of the past that have been anchored to them. She is able to uh, recognize obscure and forbidden lore she is able to uh this is max max do you want to describe your favorite useless ability <laughs> i i'm happy to she <laughs> so each of these classes they have what we call hexes right which are flavorful powers they, they cost nothing they're usable at will yeah, uh like and LeBron the can make food go bad past its expiration exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah um you know uh, amelia the sage can actually dim or brighten any of the stars in the sky in the night sky you know, and in Cana, there's not a lot of light uh, in in the world of men. So, uh, of course, uh, there are many stars up there to play with. Kind of a fun, flavorful bit because she's uh, sort of uh, someone who studied and mastered the cosmos in some ways during her uh, her tutelage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we kind of already pointed to all the awesome stuff that she can do in Kaba in terms of teleportation, swapping places with both allies and enemies to set up combos, and then just dumping a ton of uh, star fire basically on top of them. Would it be fair of me to say that the wit that um the witch is more is it would be a, a more natural fit for blaster caster kind of people, whereas the sage would be more for controllers? Oh, interesting. interesting. They're kind of so both. They're both. Yeah. I, I so I am. I I play wizards all the gosh dang time, and I, I hate it, and I hate letting other people do it. But I'm I'm a I'm a good sport, so I do from time to time. Um, and I love every flavor of wizard. I love juror wizards. I love evokers. I love enchanters. And I would definitely say that there are elements of both. Uh, both of them are able to affect the position and the movement of enemies in big ways. Braum, through his puppet, through his ability to puppeteer enemies and force them to move against their will, and Amelia with her ability to actually switch locations with people. Mm -hmm. Now. One thing I find interesting is that you guys went with a D, went with a D six um, system, yes, but what's yes. what I find especially interesting with this setup is the is the ruin system. Isn't that fun? Yeah, that's a cool one. How that, did that, that How did that come more. about, and what it what is the in, what, what is, is the, the intent with it? So, and then yeah, Mikhail, let me know. You know, I'm, I'm, maybe he'll remember different bits. We we knew okay, so. 
one of the methodologies you know we we've tried to follow is, is pretty simple you know and and um, it originates actually probably with with john wick and, and even before that maybe but yeah i was just about to say yeah yeah right. um you know he asked us a really simple question well what's your game about um you know we said well our, our game is about uh, the the descendants of these lineages using the powers of hell to fight demons, right? And he said, okay, well, what's our mechanic about that, right? And we looked at each other and went, oh, that's a, that's a really good question. And then out of that came, a question came the ruin mechanic, right? Ruin, the, the GM's ruin score represents the furthering sort of of hell's influence in the land of Cana. So essentially every time you know you are a player and you use one of these super cool abilities right you you know look into a man's soul or you speak to the dead or you light something on fire with your blood or whatever every time you do that you're calling on the power of hell your lineage curse to do that you're opening those gates just a little and ultimately you know when those gates are open hell tries its best to take advantage of it, right? They see there's an opportunity to sort of seep back into the world of Cana, and, and they're cunning. So the ruin represents that risk, right? Every time you use one of these abilities, you're going to throw a roll a ruin dice, right? Those are in our uh, gorgeous box set, right? They're these custom red D6s with the Hellguard logo, and that the, the D6s, actually, all the lettering, the fonts for those dice were designed by um, Billy Garretson. Right, who did our logo, who did the Castlevania logo, the guy's like a rock star. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll throw those 3d6, and if you get a 1 on one of those d6, the ruin score goes up, right? And that can happen often. Um, certain characters, all of the characters, in particular moments can push their roles, push their luck, right? Torvald the Breaker is this titanic barbarian of a character. Um, if he tries to lift something heavy, right, or intimidate someone with his raw sort of physicality, and, it, and it's not working, he can choose to call on his demonic bloodline, right? His scars start to glow. He seems taller. Um, the room heats up around him. When he does that, he throws uh, infernal dice, right? Ruin dice. And if he gets a one on one of those dice, the ruin score goes up. Now, there are these moments in the story um, where that will affect the narrative, right? All of a sudden, the GM will be called to make what we call a ruin roll, a ruin check, right? Um, that means they're going to grab a number of d6s equal to the ruin score and roll them, okay? Um, and essentially the result of that roll will change the story. Maybe there's a mob, right, looking to uh, looking to do violence, right, in some forlorn village. The ruin score, the result of that, might cause them to be more or less aggressive. Um, there, there could be a feast uh, which is spoiled or poisoned or worse, right? The stag that the hunter brought in gets up and begins to attack the feast uh, uh, guests, right? Uh, more and more things are affected by ruin the further you get to the, the story. Um, but anyway, that's sort of a, a rundown. Mm-hmm. Now, as I understand it, this this is designed for one-shots. Yeah. So within within the core book, I'm guessing that each of the that each of these one-shots is kind of set up like a almost like a film, I guess, in terms of it being a set of acts. Yeah, that's that's a pretty good uh, representation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. We wanted it to be narrative. I mean, you know, it's always tough with um, with, with a mystery investigation too. Yeah, there is definitely, and and in some ways too, there there are definitely some. Depending on the adventure, there are some events which are timed because things are happening in the background that you might not always be directly engaging with. But it's also the nature of sandbox and mystery investigations that you may, that the process of you uncovering new information may activate certain things. If the killer finds out that you're hot on their trail, they might do something drastic to throw you off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, with that, with that in mind, I'm ge- I'm guessing I'm guessing that you guys have taken steps to avoid the you all meet in the tavern scenario with yeah. with set with yeah. the setup for any for any given um yeah. episode. Yeah, we we don't have time for that. The, the covenant, the Esfold Covenant, right, are the group of characters you're playing. They know each other, they've traveled together. Uh, some of them even have opinions about each other and then they're, they're not all friendly opinions. Now you know, of course, we, we encourage it. It's in the bloodline of D&D and, and all these tabletop role-playing games, right? It's, it, it's in the the history of them to homebrew and to tweak and break it and hack it. So, you know, people will change these characters however they want, and we're excited to see that. Um, but straight out of the box, 
you know, you can skip all that. You know each other just like you tend to know the people you're playing with, right, in, in your local game, and you can just get right into it. Most of these adventures tend to start with a call, not always, but they tend to start with a call for help, right? A red flag left on the edge of a small village in Cana represents someone in, in need, someone in danger, um, and someone hoping that a wandering covenant, just like these five, will wander by, see that red flag, and go in to investigate. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in mind, what are you guys shooting for as far as a page count for the core book? Oh boy, depends, depends uh, on the stretch goals, depends on the next few days of the campaign, of course, you know, and the conclusion of it. Um, you know, right now we, we figure we're going to hover somewhere in that 140-ish uh, page range, but, you know, that'll change. We have uh, the uh, the illustrious B. Dave Walters, right, um, is phenomenal, um, you know, in the tabletop scene. He's uh, also a phenomenal writer, um, and as one of the stretch goals, uh, he's agreed and is excited to write an additional adventure. That would swell the page count considerably. And we actually have several additional adventures on deck for stretch goals. Um, the bestiary may get expanded. Uh, of course, the one thing we're always excited to add um, with additional stretch goals is more art, right? And art, of course, increases the page count. So, you know, it's liquid, um, but somewhere in that range. Mm -hmm. Now, as far and as far as the release window, what are you guys shooting for? Yeah, well, we're in a, in a fortunate position of, of having already done a lot of this. Now, this is not something, this is not an idea we had yesterday, right? And, and we're looking to do it next uh, next year. This is something we've done, for the most part, over the pandemic. So the mechanics are more or less settled, uh, very close. A lot of the writing is complete. You know, we have uh, uh, more to do there in terms of wrapping up these stories um, and some of the stretch goals, of course, uh, some additional art. Um, but... Uh, really, we're thinking at the very latest uh, June of 2023. Um, we're we're pretty industrious folks, and we have a pretty awesome team. Um, and because of that team, we don't have to worry about all of this. Ship Quest it has a phenomenal track record, right, of fulfillment. Uh, we have Monster Fight Club. Those miniatures that you see, those are 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 not just prototypes. Those are molds, yeah, high quality injected miniatures, and those molds are are essentially just uh, being finished off. Right? We we've played with the miniatures in hand. Uh, the campaign coins. I I'm think literally I holding a campaign coin right now. Yeah, yeah he's holding it. The guys at campaign coins are phenomenal at what they do. They're the best. Um, and believe it or not, after they saw these, they said, we have to do these. Not just that, they built the mold and we have the coins in hand. So uh, I, I would hope and I'm optimistic that we can outrun that goal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I will certainly be keeping an eye, keeping an eye out for how, for how it develops. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on to the show and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Absolutely. Thank you. Always happy. Always happy to talk about games. This has been fun. So. Mm -hmm. It's true. Max won't shut up. <laughs> <laughs> not, not for many years. Uh, maybe many years to come. There you go. <laughs> and, no, but thank you for having us. Yeah. And anytime you guys see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Awesome. Well, have a have an amazing afternoon. It was nice being here, and, uh, and I'd love to come back one of these days. Yep. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.